Center. Excited to have you on all in class today. We're going to talk about Article 3 of the Constitution. We're going to talk about the Supreme Court. And we're going to talk about the lower courts, too. And to do all this, we are here with Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center. So, Tom, you want to say hi to everybody and tell us how excited you are on this class today. Well, hello, everyone. I am very excited. A lot to get through. Nuts and bolts, text and history, court cases. It's going to be very exciting. And quizzes, because that's what we like to do when we do this. So our quizzes are no pressure whatsoever. So feel free to open up the chat and share any guesses that you have on some of these questions. And we'll go through them. Um, if you want to put it in the chat, one, and then the answer, two, and then the answer, three, and then the answer, it keeps it a little bit easier. But for the first question, how many justices are on the Supreme Court? We can go for right now. Um, but how many justices are on the Supreme Court? Feel free to put that in the chat. We'll give you guys a second to answer. Good job, Milo. Um, I see the one and then the number. Very cool. Follow directions well. Um, second question, as you kind of start going through these, who nominates and confirms the justices? That's a tricky one. I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> who nominates and confirms the justices? Third question. What are the three levels of the federal system? These questions are hard. This is why we don't grade. <laughs> what are the three, le <laughs> three levels of the federal system? Uh, and we're gonna dive into all of this today. And what are the qualifications for justices? That one is one of my favorites because it's always like, really? Like that when we get to the answer on that one today, it's gonna like surprise you. It really, really will surprise you. So it's awesome to see our YouTube answers as well. Admit, nice to see you on there. You've got nine, just like Milo, and you've got president. I really appreciate this. This is fun having two different um, screens to interact with. Hello, Elijah, nice to see you as well. So there's our quiz, but don't worry, we're gonna go through all of these and Tom's gonna answer these for us and give us the whole kind of story behind it. So Tom, let's start off with meeting the Supreme Court. And we jokingly call this their class photo. Um, <laughs> I always like to think of it as the family photo. Um, but tell us about who these people are and then who, where they're sitting and why does that matter? Absolutely. So yeah, this is the current Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, named after the person sitting right in the middle of the picture, Chief Justice John Roberts, he joined the court in 2005 and was nominated by President George W. Bush. And the two justices sitting right next to him, basically the justices end up, they're assigned these seats based on how long they have been on the Supreme Court. So if we're looking at the picture, the person that is to the left of Chief Justice Roberts is Justice Clarence Thomas. Now, as I'm looking at the picture, Curry, it's confusing <laughs> to say, is Justice Clarence Thomas. He has been served on the court for the longest period of time. He was confirmed in 1991, nominated by President George H.W. Uh, Bush. Um, and then on the other side of Chief Justice Roberts is Justice Stephen Breyer. And he is the next most senior justice. He was added to the court in 1994, nominated by President Clinton, if we then swoop all the way to the, yes, there we go, number four right there, even better, Curry, right. is Justice you, Samuel Al Sam Alito, who was joined the court in 2006, was nominated by George W. Bush, and then on the other side of that bottom row, Justice number five is Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who joined the court in 2009, nominated by President Obama, and then we hop up to the front, to the top row, to number six is Justice Elena Kagan, added in 2010, again, nominated by President Obama. And then the final three justices were all nominated by President Trump. Number seven is Justice Neil Gorsuch, added in 2017. Number eight is Justice Brett Kavanaugh, added in uh, 2018. And then the newest justice is Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who was, uh, who was added in uh, 2020, again, all nominated by President Trump. So that's the current uh, Supreme Court, that's the Roberts Court. And yeah, because when you look at this, you clearly know it's not by height. Like it's like a exactly. very, it's, it's not the way a photographer would, would, would organize the picture for sure. Um, so it's really interesting. And it's interesting they kind of go back and forth. So we get to meet the justices, we get to kind of see who they are. And this is really important because you know, we talk about in this class all the time, different styles of writing constitutional law opinions and briefs and um, concurrences or dissents. 
and you're going to get to know them or you might even already know them by reading the way they write. So it's nice to kind of see where they are, see who they are, and then connect that face and where they stand with the dissents that you might read or the opinions that you might read coming up. Now, one of the other questions we had, Tom, is how are the courts broken up in our country? So I know Article 3 of the Constitution spells out the courts. Do you want to jump there first and then we'll jump to the breakdown? Because I'm going to be honest, Article 3 doesn't give me a lot of meat. Yeah, I mean, wh wherever you want to start, Corey, just uh, point me in that direction and I'll go there. Let's do Article 3 because I like to start with the, co uh, the content or the words and then we'll look at the structure. Sure, so Article 3 sets up the national government's judicial branch, uh, the federal judiciary. It's headed by a single Supreme Court. And the judicial branch is responsible for interpreting the laws. The important power of the federal courts for our purposes in constitutional law is the power of judicial review. This is the power of the federal courts to determine whether a government's actions or laws are constitutional or unconstitutional. There's no specific clause of the Constitution that grants this power to the Supreme Court and to the federal judiciary, but there are many reasons to believe that it was there from the absolute very beginning. But that's the big power of the federal courts. But you're right, Corey, Article 3 tells us a lot less than you would think, both about how the Supreme Court's gonna function, what the federal courts are gonna look like. And you know what, that was by design. The founding generation at the Constitutional Convention, they were able to decide that yes, we do want a federal judiciary. Yes, we do want a Supreme Court. We want a highest court of the land, but they couldn't quite figure out what they want it to look like. And so what we find out from section one are a few different things here. Section one of article three, one, they vest the judicial power of the United States in one Supreme Court. And here's key language, and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. What that tells us is that a lot of the details of how the Supreme Court's gonna work, what it's gonna look like, and how the broader federal court system is gonna be work, is gonna work, is gonna be left to Congress. Congress fills in so many of those details. And so what sort of things does Congress control? How big is the Supreme Court? How many justices are on the Supreme Court? That's not written in the Constitution. So today, as we just saw from the picture, we have nine justices. The original Supreme Court had six justices. And the number of justices on the court has been as few as five or as many as 10. And over, over the history of the Supreme Court, Congress has altered the size of the Supreme Court six times. The last time they did it was in 1869, adding a new Supreme Court seat for the newly elected President Ulysses S. Grant, gifting it to President Grant as he took office. But there are other key things that Congress can determine. One, another one is the shape of the jurisdiction of the federal courts. So this is just a fancy way of saying Congress can say certain things about what cases federal judges can or even must hear. And then finally, this last one is almost mind boggling, but Congress has the power to shape so many of the details of the federal court system as a whole. In other words, how many federal judges we have? How many layers of, of, of courts do we have in the federal court system? How many courts of appeals? How many district courts? All of these details being filled in by Congress. So that's one of the big things to take away here, Curry, is Congress has a great deal of control over how the courts are going to work and what they're going to look like. The other big thing we pulled here from Section 1 of Article 3 is the idea of judicial independence. And so here, Article 3 tells us that judges, including Supreme Court justices, hold their offices for life. So the text says, during good behavior, we call this life tenure, but this really creates an independent judiciary. So federal judges, they can't be fired, they can't be fined, they can't be otherwise controlled by other branches of government once they're confirmed. Again, the big principle is judicial independence. The idea being that the federal courts have to be independent from the control of the other elected branches. This creates an independent judiciary that's there to check the abuses and the powers of the other branches of government. Judges, including Supreme Court justices, can only be removed through the process of impeachment and removal. I'll sort of pause there. Those are the big structural points though, Kerry. I think that's really helpful. And the idea that judges are going to look at the law and say, is it constitutional? Does it hold up that judicial review and the independent body away from other areas to say, I'm going to make this decision because I am sound and I'm looking at this because I swore to uphold and defend the constitution. So there are two big ideas that again, that like when you parse this out, you, you say, where exactly is that? But we look at it over time and we'll dive into that history. But one of the things that you said, Tom, is that 
talked about how we have nine justices today and that the courts are established by Congress. How many, how many appeals courts, how, what cases that they go through. So I know we're going to dive into some of the lower courts and what that structure looks like. But has there been any significant changes or discussions of changes of the way the courts have been set up today? So how long have they been set up the way that they've been set up that we're going to show everybody? And then there, are there any discussions about changing it? Well, we have, let's put it this way, American political leaders and Americans have debated what the courts should look like and what they should do from before we had a constitution all the way through to today. And sort of waves of presidents and congresses and scholars have debated the Supreme Court and what the lower courts should look like. The system we have today, the, the sort of structure we'll talk about in a little bit, Curry, it dates really to, I would say, the, the, the late 1800s and really took shape in the early 1900s. So the courts looked very different in the early days, but eventually we settled on sort of this structure, but all the way up until today, people debate how much power the courts should have, how often courts should exercise the power of judicial review, how, how often they should second guess the decisions of the elected branches, and then whether or not there should be other structural reforms to the courts, whether it's changing the size of the Supreme Court, either expanding or reducing the number of lower court judges, uh, whether you should set term limits on Supreme Court justices or members of the federal judiciary. These are debates where there are strong arguments on both sides and they're ongoing, including just today. Uh, the the uh, President Biden had a commission look at what sort of reforms they might we might put in place for the Supreme Court, a bipartisan commission. And they put out a report today um, that Americans can read everywhere and sort of look at the arguments on each side of many of these issues. Oh, that's cool. Perfect. So we're talking about some structures that have been in place since 1787, have been figured out over time and are still being discussed literally today. So I love that. Um, so kind of lay out how the lower courts are structured and what are the, the layers of the lower courts? Sure. So we have three layers of courts here in the United States. And maybe the best way to think about this, Curry, is, you know, how does a case get from the lower, lowest level all the way up to the Supreme Court? How does, how does it really, how does that happen? And when we're talking about constitutional cases, what's so cool about the process is often the cases will just start with an ordinary American looking at something the national government did, something a state government did, a town council did. It could be a law. It could be an action. It could be a regulation. And they say, wait a minute, that is unconstitutional. When the government took that action, they violated my constitutional rights, and I'm going to challenge that in court. And so many of these constitutional cases often begin with me, with, with sort of we the people or even me the individual. So someone coming to court, the first layer of, uh, let's just sort of walk through the, the layers of the federal court system. How does a case then get from the lowest level to the Supreme Court? Well, it begins, in, as you see there, in the district courts. These are the, this is the lowest level of the national court system. There are 94 district courts sort of spread all throughout the United States. It's where nearly every case starts. And frankly, it's where most cases end. So many cases end up before the district courts. And the way they're structured is that a single judge provides, uh, presides over a case, so manages the case as it comes into the courts. And then the case is decided by either a judge or a jury and someone wins and someone loses. The person who loses then has the option to appeal that case to the next layer of courts. And that's the properly named the Court of Appeals. And so that's the middle. Makes sense. That's the middle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the middle layer of courts here that we have in the federal court system. And so there, if, if, if someone ends up bringing their appeal to the courts of appeals, the courts of appeals have to hear the case. They don't have a control over which cases they hear and which they don't. If they get an appeal, they have to decide it. There are a total of 13 courts of appeals in the United States, 12 geographic uh, a circuit court, so in different parts of the country. And then there's the federal circuit, which deals with a certain set of cases that's, that, that's housed there in Washington, D.C. But the courts of appeals are going to hear the case. They're going to get briefs from both parties and they're going to decide, well, one, did the district court get it right? Or did the district court get it wrong? And so once again, the courts of appeals, usually sitting with three judges, will decide one way or the other on the case. And the person who won in the district courts could very well lose in the courts of appeals. So the courts of appeals will just say, this party wins, this party loses. And then once again, the party that loses in the court of appeals has the opportunity then to try to get the Supreme Court to hear their case. Now, the Supreme Court's different than the other layers of courts in many, many different ways. But in many ways, the most important one is that the Supreme Court has almost total control over which cases it's going to hear. 
And so once a party loses in the court of appeals, they file a petition, which is called a petition for the, for, for certiorari, which simply means it's the loser saying, loser in the lower court saying, Supreme Court, please hear my case. Here are the reasons why you should hear this case. But one thing that's really worth noting is that the Supreme Court decides to hear very, 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 very few of the cases uh, that, that, that uh, very few of the petitions that are sent to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court receives a 10, usually over 10,000 petitions from parties who lost in the lower courts each year. The court lately has decided just around 60 to 70 cases each term. So that means the vast, 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 vast majority of petitions are rejected and the Supreme Court only hears really, really few cases. In the end, how, how many justices does it take to hear a case? Well, it requires four of the nine justices to say, yes, yes, we'd like to review that case. So four out of nine, it doesn't take a majority, but it takes four out of nine of the justices. They call that, not surprisingly, the rule of four. And that that's how a case ends up on the Supreme Court's docket. So why might the Supreme Court decide to take a case? One, it could just be a really important case. It could be a really important issue of national concern. Maybe a lower court struck down an important law passed by Congress or an important regulation issued by the executive branch. And so the court decides to hear a case. The other big one, Curry, is that in, in most cases, the Supreme Court will, it will, in most instances, the court will decide to hear a case because the lower courts have actually disagreed on how to approach a particular constitutional issue. So some lower courts came out one way, some the other way. We call this a circuit split and the Supreme Court will step in in those circumstances, take a case to try to resolve that split. The idea being that we want the law, we want the constitution to apply equally and in the same way to everyone throughout the United States. And so the Supreme Court plays an important <coughs> role in that circumstance, Curry, of providing just uniformity in law, everyone being treated the same way. And so that, that helps decide what of the 60 to 100, but that's a lot of petitions to them with just a few going to them each year. Um, so that's one of the criteria. So one of the criteria is that there's a lot of splitting going on in the lower courts and they wanna kind of set the standard and set the bar. What would be kind of another reason why they would take that case? And then the second question on that do you have to follow the process straight up? Do you have to go to each layer? Or can you bounce from a district court all the way to the Supreme Court? There are exceptions. Certainly sometimes in extraordinary circumstances, you might ask, maybe because time is of the essence, the harm is great, you might ask for direct review from the district court. Supreme Court highly disfavors that, so we'll rarely grant it. Really, if they're going to look at that closely, it'll usually be because the national government, the Solicitor General of the United States is coming in and telling them, you know, this is really important for that purpose. But you, generally speaking, the Supreme Court loves process, loves things to go by routine, and really wants things to work their way through the system. Because part of the idea is that this process itself, this adversarial system of two parties making arguments before different judges over time, refines the argument so that by the time it gets to the Supreme Court, the sides have their strongest arguments ready. The Supreme Court has seen how other courts have looked at the issue and then they themselves can make, they think at least, a better decision. Awesome, that's really helpful. And it leads to two questions from our students and I'm gonna weave them in here because I think it's perfect timing. Talking about the process, talking about how the system works. So on YouTube, Admit has a question. Um, so the, the query is how, how can judges be accountable without impinging upon the independence of the judiciary. So thinking about how the system works and that there is a big process, how can they be accountable to the people when they're completely independent or accountable to any other part of the government? So I thought that was a great question. It's very similar to Mohammed's question around how does the system work to, uh, with independence? Yeah, no, and it's, it's the eternal question. I mean, scholars have debated this for decades upon decades upon decades. And I mean, in the end, the, the, the compromise that the constitution strikes out is to say, one, we are going to have some input from the political process in how justices get to the Supreme Court. So Article 2, Section 2 lays out the Supreme Court nomination process. The president nominates someone. The Senate then has to decide yes or no to confirm yes or no that Supreme Court justice. And through that, we'd say that, you know, the person who's going to end up on the Supreme Court has to get through this political process initially. But once they're on the court, the Constitution then really values a high degree of independence. And so how is the how is the justice accountable? Well, part of it is they're accountable to the oath that they make 
to uphold the Constitution. And so they're held to account by those standards of professional reasoning. They're also subject to public criticism, both from legal experts and from the public writ large and from politicians. They can't hide from that. They are just out there as public figures, so they have to endure that. And then finally, as a, as a final measure, there is the possibility that Congress has certain powers to either expand the size of the court, over time restrict the size of the court. And so there are some political controls written into Article Three. but as a practical matter, the threshold tends to be really high. It's really hard for Congress to find consensus to check the court. But as a result, we sort of strike this balance where we want a certain level of independence there written in the Constitution. We didn't want this to be like it was in colonial America, where the royal judges just served at the whim of the king. They had to follow the king's orders or be fired. We didn't want that. And so we wanted some independence in our system. But that's sort of how the Constitution strikes the balance over time. And I think that's unbelievably important to look back and to remember that as they're writing Article 3, even though I always feel like they got a little tired by Article 3 and that's why it's so short, um, but as they're writing Article 3, they're worried about what they saw go wrong in the courts. And so they're trying to put processes into place to make sure that doesn't happen again. And their lived experiences really defines how our system works today. So as we kind of like dive into this and look through, so the Supreme Court, you know, I'm upset and there's an issue and my rights are being violated. I take it to the courts. I work my way up the system and there's a rule of four. I get four and it goes to the court. What's the process from there? How does it go through? And what are the, what are the processes, the rules and procedures that they follow? And then also tell us about like, what are some of the norms that how they behave when they're listening to court cases and they do this work? Cause I love to look at the rules that are written down that apply to everybody, but the norms that they've established over time in agreement about how they decide <coughs> these cases, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So the process, Curry, it's really, it has three big steps for the justices. I love it. We've had Justice Breyer many times at the Constitution Center and people frequently ask him, what's it like to be a Supreme Court justice? And he says, you read a lot. You read a lot. And that's what this image really shows because the first part of this process for the justices is that they just get a pile of these little books called briefs where the different parties and the different groups interested in the case make their strongest arguments. And so the Supreme Court justices read through all of these briefs. And in many ways, that's you know the, the, the core of the process for them is reading and processing these arguments advanced by the lawyers. Then they hold oral arguments where the parties in the case are given roughly two hours to make their strongest arguments in person in front of the justices in the Supreme Court building. Um, and the justices ask questions, the lawyers make arguments. And so there's that interchange there in public view. And so that's oral argument. And then the final part of the process, Curry, is the process of the justices conference and then the writing of the opinions. And so after oral argument, after the justices are able to ask their questions, after the advocates make their arguments in person, the justices get, get together in a private conference. No one else is in the room, it's in secret, and the justices discuss the case. And what's so interesting about this, there are a couple of things, they're just norms that guide how these conversations go. And so the justices vote one by one on the case and sort of say their views on the case, beginning with the chief justice and then going down the line. And then as they discuss the case, what we've learned from Justice Breyer is that there's also a norm in that conversation. And that's that no one is allowed to speak twice until every justice has had a chance to speak once. And so these are conversations where these are really smart people who have strong views about the constitution, about the rule of law, probably about the outcomes of many of these cases based on their legal and constitutional reasoning. But they always uh, reason through respectfully. And because that there's that process of everyone speaking once before everyone gets to speak twice, there's a sense that everyone feels like they're treated fairly. And so at conference, they get their preliminary votes in, the, the, the opinions are assigned to um, uh, the, whoever, whichever justice, set of justices are in the majority, one justice is assigned to write the majority opinion. If the chief justice is in the majority, he then assigns who's gonna write that opinion. If the chief justice is in the dissent, then the most senior justice will assign the majority opinion to whoever's in there. And then over time, over the series of several months, usually four or five months, the justices will produce these opinions. There's usually a majority opinion written by a single justice sort of laying out the judgment of the court and its reasoning for why it's come out the way it did. But then we also see, especially in cases that people follow closely, that people care deeply about where they're really hard questions, we'll see separate opinions as well, where the justices who disagree with the majority might write one or more dissenting opinions. 
explaining how they think the case should come out and why they think the majority was wrong. And then furthermore, even those justices who are in the majority may go on to write what are called concurring opinions where they may say, yes, we agree with the outcome of the case. Maybe we even agree with how the majority reasoned in many ways, but often they'll say this was a hard case. And here are some different ways in which one might think about it or analyze the issue. And there are certainly examples throughout American constitutional history where dissenting opinions or concurring opinions are the most important opinion in the case. So in, on presidential power, the steel seizure case back in the Harry S. Truman administration in the 1950s, it's Justice Robert Jackson's concurrence that in many ways helped define how we approach presidential power. And in key opinions like Plessy v. Ferguson, it's the dissenting opinion of Chief Justice John Marshall Harlan expressing that the Constitution is colorblind that in many ways ends up being written into constitutional law in Brown versus Board of Education and onward. So read all the opinions is the lesson I think there. And we, and we love that slogan so much that we actually made a t-shirt that says, read the dissent. And that's the point. There's a lot in these opinions and you never know which piece is going to be the direction that kind of takes hold and takes the precedent. So read the majority, but read the dissent and read the concurrences. And I'm glad you brought up the zone of twilight, which is that my favorite concurrence. No, Tom, I loved also what you talked about with Justice Breyer when he came and spoke to our students. He talked about you know, everybody gets to speak once before you speak twice. And I also love what he said about that. He said, your job isn't to think about how you're gonna combat what they're saying, but it's to say, what are they saying to you? What can you learn from what you're, they're saying? And to write it all down. He had so many good behavior skills to say, this is what we do. We actively listen and try to learn what their argument is and understand their perspective on it, which we love in this class so much. And we use as a kind of a framing of how we all wanna talk about the constitution. But my other favorite story is about the door. Can you tell them one of the norms about the door? It always makes me laugh. <laughs> so the Justice Conference, again, it's only the justices are allowed in there. No clerks, no assistants, no one else. It's only the justices. So sometimes one of the justices may call for their clerks to bring a piece of paper or something. So you can see the door there in the background. There'll be a knock on the door. And then it's up to the junior justice, the justice who's been on the court for the least amount of time. They have to get up and answer the door. And so Justice Breyer was the junior justice of the court for over a decade. And so he had this job, this task, this norm uh, uh, for over a decade of his time on the court. It just makes me laugh. It's like they are so process oriented, but there's also a little bit of like teasing that goes on that the new new person has to get exactly. to the door. Um, so Amy Cohen Barrett would be the one who gets the door for a while, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, okay, so after the opinion is written, um, what is there any, like, how does it get to the public? I know every year we do this amazing Supreme Court review, which is one of our favorite, my favorite programs that we do, but what happens next? How does it communicate from the courts to the public? Yeah, so the justices, most of the most like the, the most closely watched uh, opinions are usually released in June. Um, and that's not just because the justices are holding it for, for dramatic pause or something like that. The justices only release opinions once all of the votes are final and all of the opinions are final. And so as they're writing these opinions, they're sending them to each of the justices to decide one that each justice can decide I want to sign on to that opinion or not. Furthermore, the justices may read the opinion and have thoughts that they share with their colleagues. So it's a really dialogical process in that sense. But once the votes are final, once the opinions are final, then the justices release the opinions to the public. This happens at a formal session of the court. At the beginning of a particular court session, the, court, the justices will get together, all nine of them up there. And then whoever wrote the majority opinion will then read out the summary. And then at the same time, the court itself on its website will release the opinion so any American can read it. Awesome. So one clarifying question, and I love this question from Beth. It's a really good one. When we talk about the sense and how important they can be, um, so best question is, does a dissenting opinion create an effect on the law of the land? Um, so it does it have that effect or is it more like, I always think of them like of omens of what could come. They're almost like leaning towards like, this is may maybe the way we're leaning forward. So can you kind of clarify that? Sure, it has no formal effect, but it can in, in the medium to long-term affect things greatly. It can keep certain arguments alive. And so I especially think of this, you know, in the late 1800s, we had many Supreme Court opinions that we would look at and say, they didn't do a good enough job at realizing the promise of the Reconstruction Amendments and our promise 
of equality that were written there into the Constitution. So we, they, we've had many criticisms of those particular opinions over time, but it's important that during the period itself, John Marshall Harlan was there on the court making arguments about how broadly the Constitution protected equality, how broadly it, uh, it protected freedom. And these were arguments that then scholars and politicians and judges would pick up and movement leaders would pick up on as we got into the 20th century, into the civil rights movement, up to Brown, Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965. But in many ways, it's so important to have a key figure like a Supreme Court justice making those arguments there from the very beginning. Perfect. So we're, we're almost like we're really out of time, but I really want to just hit one more thing. What are the qualifications for the justices? And you alluded to this earlier that the courts look very different today than they are back then. And we were talking with uh, Jesse Wegman yesterday and he was talking about Wilson and how Wilson was one of the only Supreme Court justices that had been um, arrested during the time that he served on the Supreme Court. So tell us a little bit about the qualifications to become a justice and to be on the court. Sure, there are no formal qualifications. There none. are none. So, I mean, it, it really, in the end, comes down to what a president wants in their Supreme Court justice and then what the Senate is willing to say yes or no to. So it's a really open set of qualifications defined, therefore, by the political process and by norms over time. And it's a reminder, again, that in Article 3, so little is actually spelled out and so much of it gets affected by norms over time. And the last thing I just emphasize, Curry, is we didn't have a lot of time to talk about judicial review here, but judicial review itself, this is that key power that the Supreme Court and the lower courts have to declare whether laws or actions of the government are constitutional or unconstitutional. And there's no specific uh, judicial review clause in the Constitution but over time, there are strong structural arguments and arguments from history that suggest that judicial review really is a core part of what the justices are supposed to do, what federal judges are supposed to do. And so we get this. If you want to read the strongest arguments in favor of judicial review, we suggest Alexander Hamilton's Federalist Paper, Essay Number 78, and then Chief Justice Marshall's opinion in Marbury v. Madison in 1803. Both of them root judicial review broadly in the, the, the principle of popular sovereignty. So this idea that our government is all about its foundation is ruled by we the people. What is a constitution? It's the people laying out the powers of the government and distributing it to different branches. And so why does the federal judiciary have the power to declare something constitutional or unconstitutional? Well, one, Article three gives the judiciary the judicial power of the United States. That's that vesting clause. What's part of the judicial power? Well, by the time we had a constitution, many judges were already exercising the power of judicial review. So it was in there. Justices themselves though, take an oath to uphold the constitution. The constitution because of article six is the supreme law of the land. And so when judges and justices step in to say something is constitutional or unconstitutional, what they're really trying to do there is to enforce the commands of the American people written into the constitution and therefore providing a check against abuses of power by the national government, by state governments, by town councils, by governors, by presidents, by government officials at all levels. Awesome. And one more, because you know how I love definitions and vocabulary, because I could do that all day long. Can you just wrap up real quick with judicial supremacy? Because it's connected to that. And I just wanted to make sure we expose all of our students to this word, as, these words as well. Yeah, so judicial review is the power to say something is constitutional or unconstitutional. That's that formal power that Hamilton talks of in Federalist 78 and Marshall talks about in Marbury v. Madison. Judicial supremacy is sort of the next set of arguments that argues that the Supreme Court is the final voice on questions of whether actions by the national government or state governments are constitutional or unconstitutional. I would say if you're looking at scholarly opinion and lawyerly opinion to this very day, there really is no one who doubts the legitimacy of Marbury v. Madison and it being an exp and sort of the power of judicial review. The big debates over how much a, a Supreme Court opinion should settle the constitutional me the Constitution's meaning in broader arguments over what the real meaning of the constitution is. And so how much power the judiciary should have when the judiciary should either defer to the elected branches or strike things down. There are still big, big debates over how broadly that power should sweep and how much authority the judiciary should exercise over time. Awesome, thank you so much. We got through all the vocabulary, all the processes and some really fun norms as well. Thank you so much, Tom. This is a great class. Thank you everybody for the awesome questions. 
um, both on YouTube and on the class. It was really fun tag teaming this. So um, great day, everybody. And if you can join us on Friday at one o'clock, Judge Rendell is going to talk about being um, on the courts and what that experience is like on some big court cases in, in the past year. So Tom, thank you so much. Students, thank you so much. Everybody have a great day. Great. Thanks, Tori. Thank you, everyone.